第十八队演讲的题目是 Number Three， 计时开始。Good morning, judges. Today we are going to give a speech of topic number three. In 2015, 30% of Taiwan's GDP relied on exports to China. The faster than expected growth makes Taiwanese government worry being over reliance on a single country might lead to financial crisis easily. Thus, President Tsai mandated new South Bond policy in 2016. The objective of the policy is to expand export to Southeast Asia countries, Australia and New Zealand. In addition to economic, to strengthen connection among Taiwan and these countries, the policy also includes multiple aspects such as culture, tourism, just to name a few. In 2019, three years after the policy has carried out, does the policy have a great influence to our lives today? The answer is definitely yes. According to Taiwan's government, there are plenty of achievements so far. First and foremost, the investment are skyrocketing. In 2017, compared to 2016. 54.5% more money has flowed into Southeast Asian countries from Taiwan. Furthermore, 15.8 more funds flowed into Taiwan from Southeast Asian countries. Second, we have signed Taiwan Philippine Law Enforcement Officer Training Act. The police department from Philippines is the most efficient police in the field of investigating drug smuggling and drug abuse. Thus, through the cooperation between two countries. We surely can make our police more efficient. Last but not least, in 2017, the tourists from Southeast Asian countries had grown 25.3 percent. Besides, 131 million Muslims has visited Taiwan. While the Global Muslim Travel Index was ranking Taiwan as the fifth biggest country that Muslims are willing to travel, but there's one more question. Why we choose Southeast Asia in lieu of any other regions in the world? The answer is that Southeast Asian countries have a lot of importance to Taiwan. To begin, obviously, these countries are neighbors. Hence, compared to other regions, we can lower the fees of transportation. Another reason is that they are mostly comprised with developing countries. As China rises. The salaries of Chinese laborers rise as well. Many entrepreneurs predicted that Southeast Asia might become the next world factory. Moreover, according to a research from the University of Chicago, experts envisioned that around 120 million people in Southeast Asian countries are likely to become middle class in 2025. The research indicates that the average consumption expenditure will be soaring in five years. As a result, the Southeast Asian countries are very likely to become the next world market as well. The final reason is that, unlike developed countries, Southeast Asian countries have a very large percentage of young population, which means they are high in labor force. As our president Tsai said, we invest in Southeast Asian countries because we have seen the world's future and the key character Taiwan should be. Furthermore, according to the estimate by experts, around 2030, Asia's GDP may exceed the summation of North America and Europe, which are two most wealthy regions in the world now. Thus, in order to catch up with the trend of economy, we ought to more actively participate in the infrastructure. On the other hand, by cooperating with Southeast Asian countries, we are making ourselves a new economic form. To draw a conclusion, to be successful on the policy, we should all work together, from government to us, high school students. We can also make a difference in the policy. Wow! Thank you.
第十七对演讲的题目是 Number Three， 计时开始。If you look at the map of the 18 countries that are the part of the southbound policy, you'll notice that they form a chain that spans from Pakistan to New Zealand. This constitutes the eastern half of what is referred to as the free and open Indo-Pacific region. In the past few decades, China has traditionally been viewed as the most important political and economic entity in the region. This is mostly due to its large population, which represents a huge market to businesses. As China has grown as an economic power, it has also expanded into the territory of its poorer neighbors by offering assistance in building infrastructure. Politically, many feel that China's growing influence produces a potential imbalance in the region. The free and open Indo-Pacific region hopes to provide an alternative source of support to its developing neighbors. Taiwan has been trying to link the new southbound policy with this initiative. Taiwan has a lot to offer its neighbors. It can be considered one of the stronger partners in terms of advancements in technology, engineering, agriculture techniques, and medicine. We can export our expertise to other countries. Not only can we help our neighbors to achieve public health and prosperity, but while doing so, we provide investment and work opportunities for Taiwanese businesses. Many new southbound policy initiatives have already in place through a program called One Country, One Center. Six Taiwanese hospitals have already made inroads into Indonesia, India, Thailand. Malaysia, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Through this program, the world-acclaimed Taiwanese medical system not only trains and collaborates with local medical professionals, but also provides a healthcare service that survives the business of community for Taiwanese business working abroad. Taiwan has offered scholarship to students from new southbound policy countries. Inviting foreign students to study in Taiwan not only can give them access from from not only can give them access to competitively rated universities, but when they share their positive impressions on social media, they increase Taiwan's visibility to people living abroad. If you look at their comments that they share on their blogs. They rave about the friendliness of the people, the generosity of to the foreigners, safety when walking through the city, and of course the yummy food. Studying in Taiwan is also viewed as a good chance to improve your future career prospects. Many Taiwanese students have been encouraged to attend schools in the New Southbound Policy Region. Challenging the traditional view of getting an advanced degree in China, Europe, or America. Actually, in many subjects, our new southbound policy neighbors have high world rankings. For example, if you want to study architecture or business, you might consider the University of Singapore or the University of Melbourne in Australia. The University of Malaya is also a great place to study computer science and engineering. Aspiring fashionistas can attend the internationally and technologically hip RMIT, also known as the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Australia. To encourage tourism, Taiwan has relaxed visa requirements for tourists from New Southbound policy countries. Tourism is an important source of income for local businesses. Just look at the number of Michelin-rated restaurants, hip backpacker hotels, and cool cafes spring up in Taipei as proof that Taipei has become a leisure destination. Taiwan's beautiful beaches and dramatic mountains are also a main draw. Taiwan has recently gained international recognition on issues of inclusiveness, social equality, and civil freedom. For this reason, Taiwan's values are aligned with free and open Indo-Pacific countries. On the colorful note, the Taipei Gay Pride Parade, held at the end of October, is said to attract more than 200,000 people. Both gays and heterosexuals march together, as one heterosexual dad and teacher stated to the reporter. I support marriage equality because it is the basic human right. We take pride in moving towards 
an ever open society. Thank you. Dear judges and contestants, good morning. If we were to visit one of our new cell phone policy partners countries for a week, we would choose Sri Lanka. Why? It has rich landscapes, world heritage sites, plenty of tea, delicious food, fun blue train, and many more for us to explore. It is one of the safest countries to travel to. We can shop at a feature store without worrying our wallet being stolen and enjoy our trip along or with our family or friends without worrying being robbed. In the following, our week-long trip to Sri Lanka will be elaborated. Let the journey begin. On day one, we'd like to wander around Negambo, situated on the west coast and at the mouth of Negambo Lagoon. It's famous for its sandy long beaches and fishing industry. The Gumbo Fish Market can be the best representative of local life. In the evening, we plan to watch our first sunset over the Indian Ocean. On day two, our first stop will be the Dambula Cave Temple. It's a world heritage site and is located in the central part of Sri Lanka. This cave monastery, with its five sanctuaries, is the largest, best preserved cave temple complex in Sri Lanka. 160 meters high, the cave holds numerous statues and Buddhist mural paintings. After that, Kauduna National Park is a perfect place to admire elephants in total freedom. The reserve is very big. Vegetation and birds here are also amazing. On day three, we will visit the Sagiria Rock Fortress, located in the town of Dambula. It's a war King Kassia Papula Palace was a majestic gate shaped as lion on the top of a rock in the fifth century. It is because of this lion that the palace was named Sagiria, and it's also on the UNESCO list. The 400 meter high rock looks pretty scenic from far away, and with 1,000 stairs to climb, it certainly means an effective workout. On day four, candy is our stop, a small cultural city with plenty of character. The Temple of Latouf, a must visit in candy, is a very important place for Sri Lankan Buddhists. Legend states that after the Lord Buddha was cremated, his remains were distributed for worship. Of all of his remains, his four canines were considered holiest, and this temple is a resting place of one of those relics. On day five, about an hour's drive from Kandy, Kaduginawa Tea Factory is our next destination. Tea is a significant export, so it's worth a tour seeing how tea is picked and which leaves make the best tea. At the tour, our lunch time destination will be Guildford, a not World Heritage site. It was built by the Portuguese on the southwestern coast of the Sri Lanka and fortified by the Dutch, making it one of the most important archaeological, architectural, and historic monuments to illustrate the European influence in Southeast Asia between the 16th and 19th centuries. On day six, we'd like to arrange a tour of whale watching in Marissa to experience the unpredictable nature of nature, wondering and anticipating the appearance of a whale. A whale watching trip in Marissa usually takes three to five hours, and our tour would begin before 7 a.m. at Marissa Harbor. On day seven, we plan to take a train ride in Sri Lanka. The train trip from Kandy to Ella has earned the title of the most beautiful train journey in the world. We will board from the top station around 6 a.m., which helps with getting a seat, something that is hard to find as the day goes on. After the train pulling into Colombo, the commercial capital and largest city in Sri Lanka, we will stroll along its hard-working streets and markets. The Red Mosque, one of the architectural wonders of the world, is located in the bustling Peda district. The mosque's distinct red and white patterns, whether swirling or alternating, is quite mesmerizing. Its tall minarets can be seen from almost every street, towering over the busy neighborhood streets. Let's recap our trip. Starting in Gambo, well known for its fish market, we will then travel to Dambla to visit its famous cave temple. What follows is the Kautula National Park, where we can enjoy our elephant safari. Next, we will make our way to the impressive Sigiriya Rock Fortress before we setting up to Sri Lanka's former capital, Kandy. After visiting the Temple of Tooth, Kaduginawa Tea Factory, we will journey south to Guildford, 
a unique mixture of European colonialism and Asian traditions, the commercial capital of Sri Lanka. Finally, we will join a world watching tour in Marisa and then take a train ride along the coast to Colombo. Do you want to circle around the country and enjoy a leisurely journey with us? You are very welcome. Thanks for listening. The number two. New South Belt countries are mainly located in Southeast Asia. Yes, it is the world's major transportation route. Many people have visited here to experience its beauty and culture. When it comes to culture, we can never miss diverse religions and languages. Indonesia and Singapore are good examples. So, let's start the seven-day in-depth trip. The first day, we will go to Indonesia to visit a place which shows the religious tolerance of the locals. The Arab countries brought Islam to the area. Later, the Dutch brought the Catholics in, so there are both mosques and Catholic churches in Indonesia. Like the Istiklal Mosque in Jakarta, it can contain 200,000 people at a time. What's more, next to the mosque is a Gothic-style church. The two religious buildings share square. When we hear the Catholics praying here, the current chanting flows out of the mosque. This also shows the religious tolerance of the locals. Then, we can enjoy dinner in the new market in the center of Jakarta. The most famous small commodity market with many specialties, tropical food, and spices. Actually, the new market has already existed since the Dutch colonial period. The next morning, let's go to the old town of Jakarta, which is full of traditional Dutch architecture and rich Indonesian cuisine, like authentic Indonesian curry, fried chicken, and coconut rice. We can't wait to have a taste and spend the morning there. In the afternoon, let's take a flight to the ancient city, Yogyakarta, to visit the Prambanan Temple, the world's largest and most beautiful Hindu temple. There is something even more amazing. On the third morning, we must rush to the heritage building, Borobuda, to appreciate the sunrise. This is the world's largest Buddhist temple. In the afternoon, we can visit the Southern Palace. Southern means the Muslim king. There is still a Southern family living here now. Then, let's fly to Bali Island. On the fourth morning, we can go to Ubed traditional market to enroll in the local cooking courses. There will be professional steaks explaining us various spices used in Bali. There are also chefs giving us recipes of Bali dishes. Besides, we can buy local souvenirs and fresh food layer. Then, how can we miss the beach in Bali? We must go to Kuda Beach, a serving paradise. In the evening, we can go to Ube Palace to enjoy the local cook, enjoy the local traditional dance performances. On day five, we can take a yacht to a nearby island off the southeast coast of the main island of Bali, Lembogen Island, quickly becoming one of the most popular attractions in Bali. Most of the residents of there are planting seaweed for a living. This is a nice place to get close to nature. In the afternoon, we should travel back to Bali to visit the Hindu temple, Purutana Lot, located on a huge rock by the sea. When the tide rises, the rock is surrounded by the sea. The whole temple is isolated from the land. Here's a suggestion. You can watch the beautiful sunset here. Finally, let's fly to Singapore. Arriving Johnny Airport, it is right time to experience multiple exotic culture mixed in a small area. First of all, let's go to Chinatown, Little India, and Kampung Glam to look at the tradition of Singapore in Buddhist, Indian, and Islamic view, respectively. Besides, we will learn more about Singapore by experiencing its diversity of food, religious architecture, and even language. We can communicate with local residents in four different languages, including English, Modern Chinese, Tamil, and Malay. 
on the last day, it is recommended to walk to the Singapore Botanical Gardens by the Bay Area, which is the only tropical garden in the world to be honored as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And of course, never miss the iconic Marina Bay Sands and the famous landmark, Singapore Flyer. We can take in all the city's main attractions. However, all things do come to an end. Believe that through this seven-day journey, we can recognize the diverse customs of Indonesia and Singapore and learn more about the new Southbound countries. Thank you. Number two, the partners of our government's new Southbound policy all have their significant characteristic, but if we have to choose one to explore, we will choose Sri Lanka, the pearl of the Indian Ocean. Because when it comes to Sri Lanka, people only know that it produces tea, and that's it. Is it? It is not. We would like to get to know Sri Lanka better by exploring it ourselves. The following is our plan and the reasons behind our arrangement. Please take it away, Nixon. Well, thank you, Derek. The first place we would like to visit is Sri Lanka's magnificent capital city, Colombo. Now you see, in the past, Sri Lanka was ruled over by Portugal, then Holland, and lastly, England. And as you can possibly tell while you're there, their architectural style is influenced by many different cultures, such as European, Indian, and East Asian. You can also see traces of their influence in Sri Lanka's language. For example, although Sri Lanka considers Sinhala and Tamil as their official language, the constitution defines English as the league language. Meanwhile, Sri Lankan nationals speak varied editions of Portuguese Creole and Dutch with varying proficiency. So, in a way, visiting there is like visiting a mixture of Europe and Asia but only closer to our homeland and smaller. The second place we would like to visit is Sigilia, one pinnacle of the Southeast and South Asian cultural triangle is located in the heart of Sri Lanka, in the ancient city of Sigilia. In the center of the city, there's a gigantic red rock that the locals call the Lion Rock. Quite epic if I do say so myself. Rising dramatically from the central plains, the enigmatic grotty outcrop of Sigiria can be considered to be Sri Lanka's single most impressive site. On your way to the top of the rock, you'll pass by a series of remarkable frescoes and a pair of colossal lion claws carved directly into the bedrock. Excellent workmanship. The surrounding landscapes, lily pad covered moats, water gardens, and cave shrines only add to Sigiria's rock star aspect. On the top of the rock, there's a palace that is known as the Lion's Platform. From there, you can clearly see the Sigirian plain extending beyond the horizon, breathtaking. Now, back to you, Derek. Thank you. The third one is my favorite, Yala National Park. Yala National Park is the most important animal sanctuary in the nation. And it also has the highest concentration of plants and animals in the world. Yala National Park is situated on the south coast of Sri Lanka, with parts of the park reaching to the water and touching the Indian Ocean. Different from safari of Africa, Yala National Park is still considered undiscovered. The next one, please. please. Well, next up, we'll voyage to New Wilia area, which natives call it Small England. Now, overlook the city of New Wilia area is the mountain Pidudu Talagara. Funny name, but it's one of the tallest mountains in Sri Lanka. Now, New Area is also known for its temperate, cool climate, and it's one of the coolest areas in Sri Lanka. It's also home for the world's famous Syrian black tea, actually. Our next destination is Tricomale. Tricomale has the world's finest deep water ports and almost makes Caribbean coast look terrible after visiting Tricomale. 
in Trincomalee also sits on one of the world's best natural harbors. The old historical city, so old that it's almost beyond reckoning. Now please, then continue. Thank you, Richard. Last but not least is the Gale Dutch Fort. As we mentioned earlier, Sri Lanka was once ruled by Holland. A walking road there reveals the history and lovely ocean views. A shore around the streets, past old warehouses, churches, and historic houses of a fine colonial architecture and a glimpse into the past. The Fort of Gale is a best example of a fortified city built by Europeans in the Southeast Asia. And please, back to you, Richard. Well, in conclusion, Sri Lanka's natural resources and historical site make it the best place to be. But more importantly, visiting those sites gives us a new perspective of seeing things and let us appreciate and respect different cultures as well. That's why we choose Sri Lanka as a destination of our exploration. Bow. Number three. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In the recent years, the economies of the southbound target countries have rapidly risen, and these countries play an important role in the world. Many countries try to work with them. For instance, South Korea announced its new South Korean policy in 2017 and continued to cooperate with India and the ASEAN nations in business and tourism. The United States also carried out its Indo-Pacific strategy and launched its first joint naval exercise with ASEAN in 2019. As we know, the southbound target countries have an abundance of manpower and natural resources in addition to being close to Taiwan. Therefore, the connections of these countries are even more essential for us. We can illustrate the importance of a link between Taiwan and these countries through many different aspects, such as medical and public health cooperation or the cultivation and exchange of talented people. Later, my partners will detail why these countries are crucial to Taiwan. Thank you, Mandy. We all know that Taiwan is recognized for its universal healthcare system and medical services, providing training programs, building supply chains of medicine, and organizing disease prevention networks are all good ways to link Taiwan to our target nations. These links will definitely enhance the bilateral collaboration. For example, in 2018, One Country, One Center program was launched Seven Taiwanese hospitals formed medical teams and cooperated with one of seven initial partner countries to exchange experiences. We not only provided professional training, but also expanded our health-related market opportunities. Besides, the Ministry of Science and Technology from Taiwan has organized the Overseas Science and Technology Innovation Centers. The centers are located in the Philippines, Indonesia, and four other Southeast Asian countries. They conduct scientific research and then share the results with both Taiwan and those countries. Through these links, Taiwan and our target countries are helping each other. It also expands potential markets and boosts the economy. Thanks to the links, we can achieve mutual profit with our southbound target countries. What do you think, Ethan? I couldn't agree with you more, Esther. Our medical services and new technologies are two outstanding fields that we can have connections with our southbound target countries. On top of that, according to our new southbound policy flagship program, cultivating and exchanging talent is also crucial for Taiwan. Through various training programs and exchanges with our target nations, we can establish channels to the shared professionals and develop a mutually beneficial platform. More and more universities in Taiwan have started to provide dual degree programs for the students from the target nations. At the same time, 
many Taiwanese students are sent to intern at corporations in those countries, which can lead to great communication between both sides. Taiwan is now promoting smart machinery and green energy technology. To cooperate with the target countries in this field, our partnerships will be built based on different strengths and conditions that we each have. This will surely lead to a stronger and irreplaceable tie between Taiwan and our partner countries. Now, my partner Chloe will conclude our speech. Thank you, Ethan. Establishing diplomatic relations is difficult for Taiwan. Therefore, the connections between Taiwan and our new southbound target countries are especially important. We utilize our strength to seek for more collaboration, innovative ideas, and mutual benefits in many fields. Through medical and technological exchanges, we can gain different experiences, expand to potential markets, and even collect novel ideas and further improve our own skills and technologies. As for the cultivations of talent and industries, both colleges and companies in Taiwan and our partner countries can help train talented people in many different professions through multiple approaches. Moreover, experts from both sides can join together and focus on industrial innovations. All these examples and methods show the link between Taiwan and our partner countries are visible, indispensable. As long as we keep heading at the right direction and try our best to seize every opportunity, we are surely on, on a path, path towards success. success. Thank you. The first for the speech is number three. Let's start. The new southbound policy was introduced to strengthen Taiwan's relations with our neighbors to the south, and from South and Southeast Asia to Australia and New Zealand. Good morning, honorable judges. We are closely linked to our partner countries through specific measures in four focal areas, economic and trade collaboration, talent exchange, resource sharing, and regional connectivity. By forging our ties with them, we share our resources, talent, and markets while creating a new and mutually beneficial model of cooperation. These endeavors build an important economic community and enable our country to integrate more fully into the regional economy. What do you think, my teammates? You're right, Will. Let me talk about our economic and trade collaboration. The economic and trade collaboration helps our country's small and medium-sized enterprises expand, facilitates exportation on construction services, and provides financial assistance, to name a few. According to the figures from the Executive Yuan, the volume of trade with the new southward countries in 2018 significantly increased from 2016. The new southbound country also had an increase on 66% in investment in Taiwan from 2016. What's more, our power plant, petrochemical, ETC, MRT, environmental protection engineering, and water resources engineering output has obtained 37 projects in 2018. Indeed, Angelina. Now, let's talk about talent exchange. Expanding exchange and training programs for young scholars, students, and industry professionals. The initiatives include bilateral academic exchange programs, a new cell phone talent matching website, and an information platform for Taiwanese companies to register their businesses and seek talent. The growth in the number of foreign students signifies the success of talent exchange that increases their understanding towards one another. What about resource sharing? We create bilateral and multilateral cooperation opportunities for culture, tourism, medical care, technology, agriculture, and small and medium-sized enterprises. The strategies include promoting agricultural cooperation, increasing two-way tourism, and attracting residents from New South Bond country to Taiwan for top quality health care. Absolutely, Philomena. Furthermore, our country promotes medical cooperation and industrial chain development. For example, the six major medical centers, including National Taiwan University and Chengdu University, are promoting in the training of talents and building industry bridges. 
they have now assisted in 336 medical personnel and have interfaced with 69 manufacturers in countries such as Indonesia, India, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, and Malaysia. How does our country cooperate with our partner countries in terms of regional connectivity? Regional connectivity enhances the signing and renewing of trade agreements, institutionalizes multilateral and bilateral cooperation, and also updates and negotiates on economic and trade agreements. For instance, the update on the bilateral investment agreement with the Philippines and India, and also the signing of the authorized economic operator with Australia and India in 2018 let 722 companies gain access to customs clearance, and they are benefiting from it. Overall, the new cell phone policy is our solution to forge the ties to the rest of the world. It is in the best interest of Taiwanese people that we should continue solidifying our relationship with these countries. As we continue to grow with them, to produce innovations with them, and to harvest the essence of what we have been cultivating. Prosperity! Prosperity. Thank, Thank you! you. Good morning. Nowadays, international collaboration has become more and more frequent due to globalization. And Taiwan has implemented the new sales bond policy to invest the market of Asian country and that of Australia and New Zealand. To assure a better partnership and collaboration, we should understand more about their culture. Now, I, who can speak English, Mandarin, Fujian dialects, and Malay, am a daughter of a Malaysia-born Taiwanese. Would like to go along with Nathan. I plan to study business and politics and feel strongly interested in the investment of ASEAN countries. And Sophie and Ellie. We are fond of international exchanges, overseas life experience, eager to learn more about other nations. On a one-week trip to Malaysia, one of Taiwan's biggest business partner in the association of Celsius Asian Nation. Our first stop will be the most famous tourist spot in Malaysia, Petronas Twin Towers, which are located in Kuala Lumpur the capital of Malaysia. Petronas Twin Towers are known as the tallest Twin Towers in the world and thus become a popular tourist spot. Since this structure was built in Kuala Lumpur, which is the political, economic, and cultural hub of Malaysia, we can enjoy the view of the prosperous city when standing on a skywalk connecting the Twin Towers. Besides the famous towers, we will also visit the historical site Castle Astana, where the governor of Sarawak lives. This castle was built in the 1870s when Malaysia was still a colony of England. At that time, Prince Charles, the mayor of Sarawak, built this castle as a gift for his fiancée. By visiting the Astana castle, we can learn more colonial history in Malaysia and understand the inseparable connection with the United Kingdom. However, to get a more in-depth observation of Malaysia, we should walk into the crowds. For a better understanding on their lifestyle and economy, we can visit the Jalan Sadok Weekend Market, which is a traditional market located in Sarawak. In this market, we can see locally grown produce and homemade cuisines of different cultures since Malaysia has a multicultural society. We can know more about their economy by observing the price of their daily essentials. And we can know more about their lifestyle by chatting with the locals there. Moreover, we cannot miss the chance to know more about their religions. We can visit the Masjid Negara, which is one of the biggest mosques in Malaysia. Since more than half of the Malaysians are Muslims, visiting the mosque would be a great way for us to understand the people's value and uniqueness 
we believe the visits can open our mind and cultivate our cultural sensitivity. Besides the value of the Muslim, we should also dig into the culture of different races in Malaysia, since it's almost impossible for us to experience everything in only one week. The easiest way to have a glimpse of this colorful land, past and present, is to visit one of its cultural centers. We set our eye on Sarawak Cultural Village, for it features replica buildings representing different ethnic groups in Malaysia. Finally, L. Ron Haber once said, a culture as a whole is the summation of its education. Therefore, our destination should be the most famous university in Malaysia, the University of Malaya. The university was fa famous for engineering and technology. Besides learning about its rich history, we will also try to find out what has made it one of the top 100 universities in the whole world. By spending a day on these places, we can surely have an understanding, though hastily, of their culture. Following our travel plan, we can improve our knowledge of Malaysia's history, economic situation, and multicultural lifestyle. We can also feast our eyes on their religious custom and educational uniqueness. As long as we know more about them, we can bridge the gap and thus make our collaboration more stable and effective in the long run. The slogan of Malaysia Airline goes, a journey of epic proportion. The light lingers in our mind and we feel only great excitement and anticipation. If only we, we have the chance. Thank you. Taiwan, Ilya Formosa, is not just a beautiful island, but a country of vitality and vigor, a melting pot of cultural diversity, and a promised land of hope and future. Honorable judges, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. If we had a chance to introduce Taiwan, we would like to focus on three domains. Our achievements in environmental protection, our development of high technology, and our integration of cultural diversity. Now, let's invite my teammate, Jingting, to elaborate. Thank you, Thomas. First of all, our dedication to nature conservation is really worth mentioning. Throughout our country, nine national parks have been established so far. The national parks are not only blessed with breathtaking landscapes, some native flora and fauna can also be found here. Take our Taijiang National Park in Tainan, for example. There, you can see endless stretches of golden sands, glistening tranquil lagoons, and lush green mangrove tree tunnels. About 200 species of birds migrate here every winter, including protected species such as the black-faced spoonbills. Although these birds were once at critical risk due to habitat loss and pollution, throughout extensive efforts in nature conservation, they have been successfully recovered in the park. By introducing our national parks, people from around the world will not only be impressed by our stunning landscapes, also admire how Taiwan spares no effort to preserve our mother nature. What do you think, Yugu? Thank you, Jin Ting. I totally agree with you. Another standout quality of Taiwan worth mentioning is our achievements in electronic technology. Founded in 1987, TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company in Shenzhou Science Park, is the world's leading semiconductor manufacturer with high-profile customers like Apple, Nintendo, Xbox, and NVIDIA. This enterprise has been driving technology with cutting-edge projects like smartphones, autonomous vehicles, and even AI robots. It is estimated that half of the world's population have used TSMC products of some kind every day. So, to what does the company owe its flawless reputation? Former CEO Morris Chan once said, 
Integrity and trust are deeply rooted in the company's DNA. Thus, it will never disclose the customer's critical information to their competitors in the same field. The TSMC is not only an example of successful enterprise, but also a symbol of Taiwanese integrity, which I believe worth introducing to our foreign friends. What do you think, Evelyn? Thank you, Yugu. I can't agree with you more. Another feature that can't be missed out when introducing Taiwan is our cultural diversity. Since the 17th century, Dutch, Spanish, Japanese and Chinese immigrants have brought their cultures and lifestyles to Taiwan. In recent decades, people from Southeast Asia have come to Taiwan for study and for work, all of whom have enriched our land. For example, at Fort Provincia in Tainan, we can see the Dutch military fort built around 400 years ago, with typical Chinese temples and Japanese houses located nearby. Even at the night markets, we can savor a great variety of exotic delicacies like sushi, ramen, kebab, lasa noodles, shrimp cookies, or egg tarts. The harmonious blending of multiple cultures has made Taiwan a unique melting pot, which I believe will definitely impress our international friends. <laughs> Back to you, Thomas. Thank you, Evelyn. Taiwan does embrace different cultures. If we had a chance to introduce Taiwan, we would like to introduce the Taijiang National Park, so they will realize how Taiwan protects our Mother Earth. Through the TSMC in Xinju Science Park, they will know how Taiwan's integrity is demonstrated in our technology. And at Fort Provincia in Tainan, they will see how Taiwan embraces and respects different cultures. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is getting smaller. Let's make Taiwan a, a partner, partner for a better world. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> wow, what a morning, right? 19 presentations back to back. I'm sure that you must be very happy that this ordeal has been over now. Okay, I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud of our young teens being able to do presentations with given such a short uh, time for preparation and you did wonderful jobs. I think you should be all very proud of yourselves. Good job, okay. And being a judge, I'm obliged, I mean, I'm obligated to give you some comments also. Okay, I wanna focus on two points. The first point is gesture. I think I mentioned that last year too, okay? And this year I want to uh, also include delivery, other delivery techniques that you use, which includes eye contact, facial expressions, gestures of course, and movement on stage and your posture, okay? These are very important because delivery shows how we deliver our message. And how we deliver our message sometimes is more important than what we say, okay? And gestures, take gestures for example, if we use them properly, it will help the speakers to emphasize what the speaker really wanna say and make your ideas more clear to your listeners. However, if we overuse them or we exaggerate them, like we use gestures for every word in every sentence, then what happened? The audience will be distracted, okay? Instead of listening to your verbal messages, what you're saying, they will be distracted by how you're saying something and sometimes you're misleading them, okay? So I think uh, if we can avoid endless gestures and over-exaggerated gestures, then our speech can improve, okay? The second thing regarding delivery is stage movement. As you know that this presentation contest is different from other speech contests. We have four members of a team to come to the stage and do 
a presentation. So the movements, okay, the change of uh, terms of speak, uh, terms of speaking is very important, okay? So how do you do it? I think uh, what we saw was a little bit too much choreography on stage. Maybe if we can limit orchestra orchestrating the movements between you and your partners, then uh, the speech can be more naturally delivered. For example, when you change partners, uh, probably we don't have to nod heads rigidly or like introducing your partner in a, you know, in a very formal way, which may take some precious time uh, from your talk, okay? So what I'm saying is delivery is part of communication, okay? In order for your message to get across to your audience, you want to sound genuine. You want to really let your expressions, your emotions express through your words, accompanied by some natural expressions of gestures. Okay, so that was my first point. My second point has to do with organization of your speech, okay? Uh, in general, the organizations are outstanding, wonderful. You've done a lot of research and you organize them. You try to reason with the audience. Great job. However, I would like to see more introductions nicely done, okay? Because introductions are very important. Like an old saying, uh, a good beginning is halfway done, right? Introduction serves two purposes, to attract attention and also to introduce the macro structure, the outline of your speech. So if you can introduce the outline clearly in, in your introduction, then it helps the judges and your audience to expect what you'll be talking about uh, later in your talk, okay? So introduction has structures too. It has usually an attention getter and finishes with a thesis statement. In between, there's a bridge, okay? Attention getter, we can build it through various methods. For example, you can start your speech by asking a question, by telling a story, or share, sharing your personal experiences, or of course, making quotations and so on, okay? Um, without an introduction, like what I observed today, a lot of teams simply just jumping into the arguments, okay, will leave your audience at a loss at least for the first 30 seconds or one minute, okay, trying to figure out where are you taking me, okay. So uh, to sum up, I think you are all very talented and you have all worked very hard, okay? And you should be very proud of yourselves. You have accomplished a lot already, but if you can keep in mind by you know, using natural gestures and incorporating uh, delivery skills properly and also probably build proper introduction, next time when you trying to make a speech, your speech will be more effective. Okay, thank you. It's so nice to be here again. Last year I was here, I was making some comments. This year, you know, I'm doing the same thing. I remember a 14th century Persian poet. His name was Hafiz. He made a very famous love poem. He said, I caught the happy virus last night when I was out singing beneath the stars. It's remarkably contagious, so kiss me. But I want to say I caught a happy virus today after I listened to your presentation this morning. It gave me such a joy, such a satisfaction so that I really feel very proud of you. So you know, you should what? Give yourself a round of big applause, come on. 
I also want you to raise your right hand. You know, I did it every year, okay? And put your right hand, everybody, come on. Right hand, right hand, right hand, okay? Put your right hand on your left shoulder and say, good job, Jimmy, come on. That's right. You know, because of this, this is a, uh, because this is a kind of competition, right? We only could just, what, select the best six teams and then the other ten honorable teams. However, I like to congratulate the winners and also the future winners. If you didn't really get in today, right, you remember you are the future winner. Okay, so you know, don't just go out and tell me, oh, you know, I'm really sorry about myself. You know, I didn't really win anything. You know, it waste. No, it's not a waste. It's a great experience. It's a learning experience. Okay, now I like to talk about your performance. So you know, Professor Job has already mentioned some of the gesture, some of this kind of organization, some of this kind of the moving on the stage, all this kind of technical thing. They are very, very important. However, I also want you to remember the most important thing is your passion. Do you have passion? Whenever you tell me something, hey, you know, Southbound is very important, right? Southbound is very important, you know. Can I just detect this kind of passion in your words? If you just stand here very stiff, right? What kind of situation would be a person stiff? A dead person. Don't stand still. Move around, look at your audience, use your eye contact, use your facial expression, convince people. Motivate your audience to follow you, to listen to you. Not only the southbound, northbound, eastbound, global bound. Try to use this kind of technique to convey the idea with your passion so that all the audience, they will follow you. They will just want to be touched. You know, I was always looking for those teams. So whenever I heard their presentation, whenever I saw their just what drama performance, right? I felt the goose bimbo. You understand? You know, that's because I was touched. I was convinced that this is it. I'm going to follow this kind of policy. I am going to do this. A lot of you, you are talking about Southbound policy, right? But what's the real goal? What's the ultimate goal? You have to understand the soul, the international cooperation, the true spirit of whatever you want to convey. If you just limit to Southbound, right? It's what? Too limited. Focus more. Focus more on the global society, global village. Imagine one day we're living in this kind of unity. What kind of future we, global villagers, could have? So, you know, broaden your horizon. Expand your vision. Can you really see the thing that people cannot see? So remember one thing, passion is important. And I'm also very glad that a lot of you, you were using quotations. You were using Mandela, Nelson Mandela. You were using a lot of very reliable statistics. Those are good. Try to use this kind of term to convince people, to really make your words more persuasive. And also maybe try to change or rewrite one or two words so that whenever you are borrowing this kind of original sentence, quotation or words, and then when you apply them in different kind of situation, and the idea will be more forceful. For example, global warming. Is it good or bad? Global warming, good or bad? Bad. Bad, but it's about climate. So whenever we're talking about climate, the weather, global warming, bad. But we want to promote global warming in our heart. We want all the people in the world, they will have this kind of warm toward the people, right? So you know, sometimes if you change one word, change one, two words, change a few just what, actually very minor part, you can really impress your audience in very, very different ways. And another thing is repetition. Try to repeat the important things. We always like to emphasize, oh, you know, I want to tell you three times, right? Why? Why do, why do I tell you three times? Actually, because it is what? Important, right? So, you know, whenever you are making a point, right, you have the introduction, you have the, just, well, you know, preview, you have the body, you have the conclusion summary, and then don't forget 
always repeat the most important thing you want your audience to remember, to take home, to think about. So do not forget, repetition is something you always can use in improving or impressing your audience. A lot of time, we need to include some other things. For example, stories. I didn't really just hear too many stories. However, whenever you have stories, right, they are impressive. I like to tell stories because always remember when you graduate from the high school, maybe one day your university, right, don't put your GIE, don't put your TOEFL, don't put your GPD TOEIC scores there only. Oh, you know, my GPD, my just TOEIC 900, I'm so proud of my, you know, record. No, 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 you put your storytelling ability there. You tell people, hey, this is the story. This is the story of Taiwan. This is the story of me. And then when you listen to my story, when you hear my story, right, are you inspired? Am I able to inspire you? So try to include some stories in your talk. And then people will remember. Maybe they will forget all the process today, but they will remember the story. So I remember JFK, 1962, when JFK was invited to give a speech at Rice University. It was a very famous talk. It's called, it was called Moon Talk. He was talking about one day, I'm going to send the American astronaut to the space, to the moon. We're going to land on the moon, 1962. But most of these government advisors, scientists, just ask JFK, how could you say that? Right now, we don't have anything. We don't have the material. We don't have this kind of invention. We don't have this kind of technology to send our spaceship to just what? To the space, to the moon. How are you so sure? What makes you think that we can do it? JFK said five words. He said, the will to do it. The will to do it. So if you just have the will right now, it's not possible, but in the future, it is possible. Don't look at other people as the seed, the acorn. Look at other people as the oak tree, the big oak tree. So no, you are the young generation of our country. So I hope that all of you, whenever you walk out, you walk out confidently. Henry David Thoreau, very famous writer in the United States. I like his sentence here. He said, if one advances confidently in the direction of his dream and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. So I hope all of you, when you leave this place, don't think about you are winning or losing. You're all winning. Maybe not now, but near the future, you're going to, going to see the result. So ladies and gentlemen, students, just what? I hope that you can all walk out, advance confidently to your future. Good job. Thank you very much.我们是第十八届的外交小尖兵现在要跟各位报告
呃赛事。那竞竞争的结果呢？呃，无论如何，一定您都会有成长。所以呢，我们彼此祝福，无论结果是什么。好，我这边要先呃宣布的是，我们有十名表现优良的学校。第一个队伍，序号二，国立台湾师范大学附属高中。好，第二支队伍是序号八，台北市私立威格高中。好，好，第三个队伍是序号十五。桃园裕达学校财团法人桃园市裕达高中，好，第四个队伍是我们序号十六新北市私立圣心女子高中，好，第五个队伍是序号十七台北市私立延平高中，好。第六个队伍是序号十九，复旦学校财团法人桃园市复旦高中。好，接下来是序号二十四，学校财团法人新北市私立格致高中。接下来有三剩三个队伍，好，序号三十。慈济学校财团法人慈济大学附属高中，接下来是序号三十二，新北市私立竹林高中，好，以及序号三十三，台北市私立华兴高中，非常恭喜这十对表现优良的学校。越来越紧张了吼、哦，接下来是我们呃入围优胜有六个学校，接下来要参加我们十二月中的这个决赛。好，第一个队伍，序号一，桃园市立武林高中；第二个队伍，序号四，国立政治大学附属高中。第三个队伍，序号十三，新北市私立淡江高中。第四个队伍，序号二十，台北市立大同高中。第五个队伍，序号二十六，台北市立成功高中。好，最后一个队伍。三序号三十四，台北市立复兴高中。好，一样恭喜以上六队的入围优胜学校，谢谢。